So welcome everyone, thank you for coming. Um, today I'm going to be talking about the rest, ca rest category of the hither in Iraku. Uh, so um, the hither is one of the forms the selector can take and most of its uh, uses can be categorized, uh, but some of them can't. And this rest category is uh, the topic of my, of my paper and thus this presentation. And the basic question I ask is, um, what does the hither add in these occurrences? So before we dive into that question, I will give a, a brief table of contents first. I will first say a few words about the selector in Iraq, then I will talk a little bit about the hither uh, and what we already know about it. And then I'll go into uh, my into uh, looking at the rest category in two parts. I did, I did a context analysis first, so I'll go uh, through some of the results uh, on that with you. And then I will give a possible explanation uh, for uh, the use of the hither in this rest category. And you all get, already get a sneak peek here, but more on that later. So um, according to Maus, uh, Iraq has bas basically has two verbs, the verb to be and other verbs. And every sentence needs such a verb to be, which is also called the selector. Now, Maus sees it as similar to to be because it can combine with both nominal and verbal complements. We'll focus on the verbal complements here, as that is what the hither combines with. And I give an example, not with the hither, uh, in one. So you very clearly see that eat there is a, a verbal complement because it is inflected for both subject and for tense, but it is preceded by the selector. And we also see that the selector also has a prefix on it, which is one of the several affixes it can have. So we have a complete overview in this table here. Um, so I'll, I'll get back to this a little bit with the context analysis, but just so you know, a lot of the inflection on verbs takes place uh, on the selector instead of on the lexical verb. So the hither is one of the uh, forms this, uh, the selector can take, and it is realized as either ni or na. Uh, before I go into the context of the hither and the functions of it, a quick note on terminology. Uh, the hither is also often referred to as the ventive, uh, for example, by Bourdin in his papers, and also in the corpus by Berg and Kiesling, which we'll also see later on. However, I follow Maus who uses the hither, and the reason for this is that ventive implies a heavy emphasis on movement, even though there are many uh, occurrences of the hither where no movement is involved at all. Uh, still, there is this core meaning of movement towards the didactic center, um, and in this way, the hither is often contrasted to the thither, which is movement away from the didactic center. So the hither is a wide, widely known phenomenon across language. Uh, we also see it in Cushitic languages. So in 2005, Maus looked at uh, 15 of these Cushitic languages and saw that only three of them do not have a hither marker. Now, interestingly, Iraku, Iraq is one of the five that does have a hither marker, but no thither. So you won't hear me talk about the thither again. As I already mentioned in my introduction, uh, some of the functions of the hither are already known, and I'll go through uh, these with you now, giving you an example of each one. So the first should be no surprise, it's the prototypical function of the hither of movement towards the didactic center. So here you see that when I arrived yesterday, he was writing two letters, and you see that the hither combines with the lexical verb arrive, which in and of itself is this movement towards the didactic center. The second function we already know is uh, illustrated in, in three. Um, a quick note about this example, you can see that uh, it, it says vent instead of hit. The reason for this is that this is taken from the Berg and Kiesling corpus who we'll use ventive instead of hither. So it's the same. Uh, so if you see vent, just think hither and you'll be fine. So here you can see that curse is inflected as an imperative and it is combined with the hither before that. The third and last uh, category we already know of is that the hither can also be used to emphasize that the subject is, is, is in first person. So we, we have an example here in four, uh, and uh, it says that father doesn't want us to dig. And the idea here is that really this us is emphasized. So he doesn't really care whether you dig, but he doesn't want us to dig. As I already mentioned, uh, not all examples fit into any of into these three categories. So we see one of these examples here in five. We read that, and when mother saw her, we see that there is no first person subject, there is no verb of movement, and there is no uh, imperative. So the question is, what is the hither doing there? So the first step I took in answering this question was to look at the context of the hither. 
my methodology was as follows. I took the Berg and Kiesling corpus from 1988, which is a collection of narratives, and I extracted all uh, instances of the hither. There were 591 of them. And then I categorized these uh, instances into uh, one of the three categories we already know and a rest category. And this rest category uh, is what the further analysis is on and it contained 104 uh, occurrences. So I looked at several uh, contexts in which the hither can take place, but I'll go through uh, only those that are relevant for our next part as well. So the first thing I'd like to talk to you about are the affixes. Um, here we go back to the table we saw first, we saw before um, that several affixes can attach to the selector and several and these uh, and, and thus the hither. So uh, I've left out the adverbial and tense affixes uh, due to low realizations. Um, but if uh, we look at the table, uh, table two, we see uh, the relative and then uh, behind brackets, uh, behind that, uh, the absolute occurrences of the hither with each of, of the affix with each, uh, which, with the hither. So if we look at the aspect, we see uh, that the perfect and the background affixes are quite common. Now, if we look at mood, we see that no affix was most common of all, but if there was an, aff if there was an affix, we see that it's uh, most probable conditional. Now, the low frequency of the questioning affix there tell also tells us something, namely that um, the hither is probably used most in declarative sentences and not inter interrogative ones. So taken together, this tells us that the hither quite often combine, comes in contexts that are perfect and background. And we can see the conditional as a sort of background here. It's a hypothetical background, because when you look at the conditional, it's like when something happens, then something else happens. And this when part, that is where the hither comes in. And we can see that as, as a sort of background to the main event, to the um, one thing that comes after that. So the second, second thing I looked at was uh, the lexical verb, uh, the hither and patterned with. Uh, here you can see um, the transitivity and uh, the frequencies surrounding that, again, with the relative numbers and then the absolute numbers in brackets behind that. And you can see that most verbs are transitive. We can also see this uh, when we look at the uh, individual verbs that were used. Some verbs, uh, so as you can see there, only 44 different verbs were used across the 104 instances. This can be explained by the fact that some verbs were used quite often. And here uh, come in the perception verbs that we heard you won't just talk about. Perception verbs are quite often uh, used with the hither. So for example, uh, the verbs ar and arim, uh, see and the see with the durative, uh, are used 32 times in total. So keep this in mind because we'll come back to it. So we now have this context analysis. And it gives us some interesting tendencies, but there's nothing really, there's no one analysis that comes out of it that we can use to ca characterize what the hither actually does. So I looked for such an analysis and I think I found one. Uh, so Bourdin in 2008 wrote a paper on the narrative um, aspects uh, uh, hither can grammaticalize into. In previous papers, he already showed that the hither can grammaticalize into quite different structures. It can grammaticalize into a passive, into a mark, marker of the future, and into a marker of the progressive. But in 2008, he showed that hither markers can grammaticalize into markers of textual connectivity. Now, there are several types of textual connectivity they can um, denote, and uh, the primary one is sequentiality. The idea is that the verb then uh, describes motion in time from one event to the next. So interestingly, this doesn't really lie that far from the source meaning. Instead of actual movement, movement, we see narrative movement instead. So there are other types of textual connectivity we also see. And the only other one I'm going to talk about today, because it's, that's the only one that's relevant here, is purposiveness. And the idea here is that um, the, the action that is taken is taken with purpose, with intention. It's not just something that accidentally happens. So if we use these two categories to categorize our rest category of the 104 instances we got from the context analysis, we see that there are 87 that we can classify as sequential, 11 as purposive, and that there are six that we cannot categorize as either. Now I will first give you examples of the sequential and the purposive, uh, and then I'll go into the six that we cannot categorize. So before I go into the first example on sequentiality, a quick note in the examples, 
Uh, these are all taken from the um, Berg and Kiesling corpus, and I've used the original format because it's quite a nice format to use once you're used to it. But it can be a lot of text, so I'll talk you through it first before going into the example itself. So every sentence or uh, clause has um, four lines. The first line is the text in Iraq, then we have the morphemes, then we have the glosses of the morphemes, and then we have the translation in English. So because this can be quite a lot of text, for this sort of analysis, you need quite a lot of context. I've made the text in Iraq and the translation in English blue, so if you're lost, look for that. And I've also uh, marked the hither and the lexical verb patterns with uh, in bold. So let's go into this example. So this is an example of sequentiality because um, we see that they were running away and then something else happens. Namely, when the antelope looked at him, it was her husband. And we see that the clause where this shift, where this movement forward in a narrative comes in, that is where the hither comes in. We see sequentiality in seven here as well. It is in a different way though. So we read that he was being killed by a certain man. Then a narrative tells us a lot about this killer, that he wasn't that smart, etc., which is the part I left out. And then you see how he got killed was like this. So in a way, the narrative goes on by going backwards, but still the narrative is moved on to, to the next event. Now, the, uh, most of the, so all of the uh, ones I uh, marked as sequential can be analyzed in this way. Um, and here is also where the perception verbs come in. So I think uh, the high frequency of the perception verbs can be explained by the sequentiality idea. We see this in six already, because if we see or hear something, that is usually the cause of something else happening. And we see that in these narratives a lot. So let us move on to purposiveness. Just to recap, purposiveness is the idea that an action is done with intention, with purpose. So in eight here, we read that once upon a time there was no rain. And then we read that someone had let the rain get lost. And then we read the part where the, uh, where the hither comes in, namely the reason why she had let it dry up was a certain girl that she wanted and whose name was Ari. So here we see this intention, the rain didn't dry up by itself. It's no accident, someone made it so. And this is also where you see that the hither comes in. So there we have purpose. And another example of purpose uh, is uh, one we can see here in nine. So it's a different kind um, because we, we see it already in the lexical verb the hither patterns with. So you see that the hither here patterns with the verb want, which in and of itself is a marker of intention. So if we have such an analysis, it would have been, of course be most beautiful if we could analyze all of the instances we have in its terms. But unfortunately, that is not the case. As I already mentioned, there are six of cases that we cannot analyze in this way. And I'll go through them now. So one of the cases is quite different from the other five and I'll go uh, and I'll look at that one with you first. So here uh, we see that instead of adding sequentiality or, propose or purpose, the hither adds movement. So we read many times, you have come to eat for the bodies of my parents. If we look at the context and at the sentence itself, there is no other, way, other place this come in the translation could have come from instead of uh, the hither. Now, of course, this could be a free translation, but that seems doubtful. And interestingly, this is the only um, instance of the rest category this happens. Most of the time when we see movement, the hither combines with the verb of movement as we saw in the example I gave. As I already mentioned, the other five are quite different and I'm not sure how to analyze them. So if anyone has any ideas, they're more than welcome. The, uh, so I think they, the other five are quite similar though because uh, um, I think they all give some sort of background information. So um, I'll, I'll give two examples to go through with you, uh, through them with you. I have the other examples in my PowerPoint as well, if you want to see them, but let's look at 11 first. So here we read that this man may deceive him as long as he has seen the sign. And you see that the hither comes in in the second part, this as long as he has seen the sign. And we can see that as a sort of background to when this man may deceive him. It is not the main focus of, the, of the, this piece of text. The main thing is that this man will deceive him. Of course, it is a hypothetical background, but that is logical because the condition, conditional is also in there. 
So um, the, the other example I give here in 12 is without a conditional. We read that when they come home, the people who have gained booties will have to be given, um, I think, cattle by their parents and relatives. And uh, the hither here patterns with the verb gaining for gaining booties with slukum. Um, so we see that this can be seen as a kind of background information to who will be given cattle. Only those who have, have gained booties will be given cattle, not the rest. So um, as I said, the other three can be analyzed in similar terms, I think. And the interesting thing is that um, none of these have the background morpheme in them. Uh, so we saw in the table right at the start uh, that there were uh, that uh, there are so there are also background affixes that can attach to the selector, but we see them with none of these five. So I think that is an interesting uh, thing as well. So to conclude, our contextual analysis showed some interesting tendencies, but gave us no definitive answers. I think that textual connectivity does give us this answer. Most of the uh, instances we have can be analyzed as textual connectivity in general and sequentiality and purposiveness in particular. Of course, there are six instances that do not fit in the, into this mold, but the great majority, almost 95% of the data does. So further work needs to be done on the six and um, further work could also be looking at as whether this analysis only works for the rest category of the hither or also, or also for other categories of the hither, such as the ones where we see the first person subject. So that was my talk. Here are my references and uh, thank you for listening. And thank you very much, Julius. I think that it was um, clearly looking at a, a large quantity of data. It's really nice to see um, you trying to bring some order to this uh, to the chaos, I think that 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 exists in that rest category. So, um, yeah, fantastic. I see that uh, Anna Maria has her hand up for a voice question. So, why don't we uh, start? Thank you very with much you. for this. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Thank you very much for this very interesting talk. You gave me actually a lot of ideas for the languages I am working on because I have actually also. Uh, a venative or a hither uh, that has narrative functions. And I was wondering, um, I read recently an analysis by Christa Kilian Hatz for the language Que, and she analyzes the hither in that language uh, also with a narrative function as a new event marker. Do you mm -hmm. think, but from what I saw in your data and also what I know from my own data, I guess what she means with new event could in a lot of cases um, and be analyzed as sequentiality. Yes. Do you agree with that or do you have any insights on that from the data you looked at? Yeah, so I think that is right. So I think often we see this hither when something else happens. So that is basically a new event. And we often see that this is when someone sees something or hears something. So I think that analysis works. Yeah. So it sort of could also be interpreted as an attention catcher, sort of to say, ah, and now um, something yeah. you pay attention. Yeah, I think to so. Yeah, it's like an introduction okay. to the next event. It's like it moves the narrative forward. Yeah. Very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll uh, I'll jump in there. When we thought of things that were unexpected, or uh, uh, makes me think of makes me think of the two Iraq interjections, Nahis and Nangay, both of which can begin with an N. So I don't know if that has something. That's that's you know that's something to think about. Uh, I've I've been thinking a lot of yeah about the about the possible origins or the possible um, grammaticalization paths of, of this. Um, Bonnie. Thanks. Uh, I'll be quick. Uh, there is a Central Sudanic language with a Ventive, this paper by Noikum that I put in the chat. So he uh, talks about it having a resultative function, but this language doesn't have a past tense marker. So it's taking on these past tense markings. So you might want to look at that paper and get some ideas because, I mean, Iraq does mark past tense, right? So yeah, it does. The, the, maybe the, the places where it squeezes into the functions are going to be more limited, but you might see some similarities as what's going on here. Thank you. I'll have a look at that. So yes, so Bonnie provides the uh, the link there in the chat. Great, uh, Martin. 
Yes, thank you. And thank you, uh, thank you, Ana Maria and, and, and Bonnie as well. I think that Jalisa, yes, that would be nice uh, further more precision of that uh, the meaning of uh, I, but my 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 remark was to the to your second exception i think the glucum the the booty example yeah i was wondering just when i was going through that example could it be an uh, an uh, example where the it is towards the it is similar to uh, towards me but now towards the didactic cent center that is imagined with the protagonist those those uh, those parents that that have to uh, provide cattle then so if they get booty for them though keeping those people in mind then then they will have to uh, provide cattle i wonder better that's a really interesting um analysis so I also looked at the rest of the context. And before that, it talks about how they gained booty. So that is why I analyze it as, as a background, because it, it goes back to uh, the fact that they did and then goes forward to another part. Uh, but it's an interesting idea that uh, this booty is, is in a way a sort of movement because it goes back to the parents. So I'll, I'll yeah, look it's at that because again. It's because it goes to them that they have yeah. to pay uh, capital. Right. Yeah. And and uh, I guess I have I have those other counter examples, but I'd love to look at them and 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 hear this Richard who is called Andrew as well. Send them to us. Yeah, yes, I will. I'll, um, yeah. I will. Yeah. yeah, it'd be nice to look. Do we have any further? Thoughts. I, I prefaced something earlier on. I'm interested in. Do you have any thoughts on on where this might have come from? Uh, that's probably not the uh, the 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 point of what you're of of the questions that you're asking. But I wonder if you've ever sort of if it's ever crossed your mind. Where in the heck did this uh, morphine come from? Yes, it has. But I haven't looked into that. So that is an interesting question. Um, so. Yeah, it could be. Uh, so I, I haven't looked at uh, I haven't looked at this enough. So uh, it could be maybe coming from some sort of verb that was once there, uh, which is then uh, grammaticalized uh, already. So which is then already becoming um, instead of an independent verb, something dependent. Uh, but maybe Martin has more thoughts on this because I have I, I have to admit that I haven't looked into it at all. Okay, so that's an interesting one. I'll I'll, I'll consider as well. But maybe not completely central to your uh, to your paper, so don't don't no, worry about true. it. That's just where my my mind goes on these things. Felix has his hand up. Uh, feel free. Thank you very much for this in interesting talk. Actually, I'm just thinking along. So, in your analysis, in your talk, you talked about this having something like a background, something. Mm -hmm. Then Anne Marie comes with a suggestion that it's a uh, new event and you seem to think okay that's also okay but if it's background and then it's new event then i'm confused yeah so that's what confused me as well but i think there are two separate things so we have the examples that so that show show the sequentiality this new event on the one hand but on the other hand we also have um have them showing this kind of background information uh structure so i think those are two different uh, kinds of examples, um, and of, of yeah, the question then is um, why. Uh, so the so yeah, so I'm not really sure about that. Uh, things I thought of was maybe they were taking a different grammaticalization route, or maybe this is kind of like a, a narrative function already, but then in a different way. Uh, so I think that's a really interesting question: uh, where this distinction comes from, and how they can both coexist. And if I may just add a small question, there's this, well, you know, when you talk about the rest category, I'm always a bit, uh, so where does the rest come from? 
yeah so it's uh, yeah so that's all so, yeah that is um maybe an unfortunate naming choice i wasn't sure how else to call them because they're just the the hither hithers that can't be categorized into any of the functions we already have um so yeah maybe uh, there has to be a better name for that but to have a better name we also have to have a better idea of the function of them i think well so it's like the peripheral uses of it as opposed to the central let me put it that way. yeah so i'm not sure whether we can say that they're not central i'm just um i'm just saying that um they haven't been analyzed in that way before for iraq so we see that they have been analyzed by bourdin in 2008 already uh, for other languages in that way but I, I don't really know whether we can say that it's not this that it's more or less central than for example emphasizing that it's a first person subject because there are quite a lot of examples that do not fit into any of the categories. So maybe you should throw the categories away and start afresh. Thank you. Yeah, that's nice as well. <laughs> yeah, might be a useful, might be a useful um, approach, uh, Felix. Bonnie mentions very quickly here uh, in the chat, we might expect eventive to come from the verb to come. So, uh, and, there's a, uh, and there's a reference attached as well. Um, so you. that's something to think about. Um, Martin, you have a voice question. Uh, it's just a follow up um, to, to Felix's uh, confusion. So uh, it, it is in, in a number of the cases, it seems to me, uh, the combination of the two indeed to say to, as, as a narrative function to say, okay, we know this uh, and it, it's not that, it's not just backgrounding, but it's taking that information as being vital for what is coming just now, which is uh, not an automatic uh, um, consequence, but some a new step in the story. I, 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 I would, yeah, I would like to Jalisa to 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 see whether that's more specific kind of of defining background. Uh, how for what kind of percentage that that would really work because that would be nice to have it more more specifically narrative function than than simply background because there are a number of very other very general ways in which we do backgrounding in in Iraqi narratives. Yeah. Bonnie um, mentions again that Kosman says ventive refers to acts of becoming. Uh, with another reference as well. So um, that might be useful uh, too. Uh, uh, Jalisa, I don't know if you have, if you want to, um, if you want to respond to any of that um, right away. Oh, I haven't, sorry, I haven't read them. I, I, I was just planning to read the papers and then see. Oh, no, uh, no yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but um, I think the, that the fentif comes from a com verb is what I was trying to say. That is, it is grammaticalized from a full lexical verb in, into something that um, has to have something else attached to it, uh, more of a grammatical function than really the lexical function, even though it can sometimes still bring this lexical function. Right. Uh, Felix. Uh... Yeah, I, I just wanted to continue on Martin's line. So we are doing so I, I like the idea of the, the thing. So what I wanted to suggest is maybe you would want to look at the work of uh, Robert Longacre, where he talks about storyline, storyline concerns. So you've got the development of the story, and then you get these different, like when you say this background, and then there's this other event coming and so on. And, and there tends to be a balance between the kind of tenses and aspects that occur on the main storyline versus quote unquote, the background storyline. So it might be a way of teasing apart some of these issues. Thank you, I'll look at that. Yeah. And on a I'll, I'll give you the last comment. And on a similar line, I'm wondering if it isn't similar narrative function to where you say, now then we do this and, and using other kinds of dictics in that way that's a good question as well so compare them to uh, the narrative function of other elements yeah that's interesting and that the Freisinger um reference that i put 
me think of that because it's very much they're like locationals. You know, well, we know that with the uh, motion verbs, but as far as location without necessarily the motion happening. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is similar in that way. So that is very interesting to see whether they have a similar uh, set of uh, circumstances in which they occur, whether the contexts are similar, or whether the hither really has a different specific uh, set. Excellent. Thanks. And uh, so, so uh, that does bring us to the end of the uh, final talk. So uh, I would ask uh, you all to join me in uh, in giving Jalisa a, a warm round of applause for uh, an excellent presentation. Um, and here we are at the formal end. I've blocked off a little bit of time for for sort of general conversation and discussion. Uh, so I, uh, I, I can give us until 10 minutes after the top of the hour, but I don't want to keep anybody. If people do need to run, that's completely fine. Um, but uh, it might be, might be healthy to have, uh, to have a more sort of general discussion about ideas or if people had thought about things from other presentations that they want to bring up now that they've had a chance to ruminate a little bit more. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll open it up. I'm actually going to stop the recording because I have a feeling that that will probably allow us to speak a little bit more easily. Um, so I'll stop the recording now. And, uh, and if we would like to, uh, to chat a little bit more, uh, feel free to do so. Well, what a fantastic sense.